Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and the stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast and at a number of other online venues. There is some one myth for every man, which, if we but knew it, would make us understand all he did and thought. William Butler Yeats In many cultures is the recognition that when we come into this world, we come into a story that's wider than our personal one. Whether it's being born on a particular saint day in a Christian country, or born perhaps on the birthday of one of your ancestors, or even born on the special day of a god. The idea has been prevalent probably as long as human beings have been on the planet, that our story is bigger than the story we recognize. Here in the West, we tend to reduce everything to personal story, but it's much wider than that. And this leads us directly into the territory of personal myth. Now, a personal myth could be thought of as another layer to who we are. So, for instance, we play many roles. We may have the uh, role that our family gives us. We may have our different selves, like our physical self, our spiritual self, perhaps, and others. And the idea here is that we also have a mythic self, that we are actually born into a particular mythic situation, that behind our biography is a mythic biography, one that we can make creative use of. I think of um, something that Hermann Hesse wrote in his novel Damien. He wrote, My story is not a pleasant one as made up stories are. It is a story of nonsense and chaos, madness and dreams, like the lives of all men who stop deceiving themselves. That's one way of holding it. But in order to understand this idea of a personal myth, which is something that Jung noticed about his life, we need to talk about what is a myth. And here our point of departure will be something that Christine Downing wrote. It's my experience that the myths we enter most deeply are not the ones that we choose out of some book of myths. Rather, in some profound way, these myths choose us. So myth is sometimes dismissed as an archaic explanation for something that science now understands, like weather. And it would be more correct to say, actually, that myths are sacred stories. They're originally oral tellings. They're found in every society, and the tellings grow with the fascination of the listeners. And so eventually someone who has a a great story to tell, maybe it's based on a visionary experience or a dream or what have you, they tell it, other people tell it, and gradually an entire mythology forms around the story. If this mythology is resonant with a particular social group, then they might form religions and institutions around it. And so, the stories live on as long as they're both relevant and entertaining. There's a comparison that Joseph Campbell made. It's not exact, but it does help illuminate what myth is. He compared myth to a dream, and... Just as our dreams tell us things that we forget during our daily existence, they bring it back to us in symbolic form, so the myths of a culture are like collective dreams. They bring back to us what we forget as a culture. And so a myth isn't simply an explanation in the head. It's a deeply embodied set of stories that address whatever's happening with the collective at a time when events prompt the deep psyche to restore them in new ways. 
And again, as Campbell pointed out, it's important to remember that myths are metaphoric. They're not literal. When we dismiss Persephone as a mere rape victim, we not only disempower anyone who identifies with Persephone, we take the story too literally. The story of Persephone is a story about what happens when, in our innocence, we get dragged to the underworld and, yes, raped. But the point of, on which the story turns is what happens then. What does Persephone do about this? And actually, she becomes queen of the underworld, <laughs> which is a very empowered place to come from. And she alternates so that she spends three months of the year in the underworld and the rest of it in the upper world. So Persephone is not just a victim. She's one of the great powers, one of the great archetypal powers of death and rebirth. So although myths don't deal in literal truths, they deal in the great symbolic existential truths, the truths of our very being. I'm thinking of something that Jung wrote in his book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, at the beginning. He says, What we are to our inward vision and what man appears to be under the aspect of eternity can only be expressed by way of myth. Myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than does science. One of the tasks I sometimes give my students or workshop participants when we're talking about personal myth is that I ask them to reimagine their birth story. So the scientific objective way of understanding a birth story is I was born in such a place at such a time to such parents and so on. It's the facts, right? The dry facts, which don't really tell us that much beyond themselves. But if you reimagine your story as a myth and you give it a metaphoric cast, then it becomes a drama full of power and insight. So what if your story sounded more like um, there was a warrior who came back from the wars exhausted? could not have anything more to do with battle. And he chanced to meet a mysterious woman who wanted to know what he knew about war. And so right from the beginning, their romance was filled with a tension that ultimately would not prove resol resolvable and actually would end the relationship, but not before a boy was born caught between these two worlds. And so what I've just given you in metaphoric form is a reimagining of my birth story. So I recommend doing this yourself to get more at what Jung is talking about, the, the truth that's revealed by a mythic telling rather than a literal one. Imagine how boring the great literature of the world would be if it was only objectively stated. Steven Pinker did that once to Romeo and Juliet. It was just awful to listen to. It just drains all the meaning out of it. Imagine Shakespeare, or actually one of Shakespeare's characters, let's say Hamlet, telling the audience something along the lines of, um, I'd like to do more in this situation, but I'm afraid to, right? Whereas the actual lines that he spoke are, Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Hamlet, what's the matter? Oh, I'm overthinking something. So myth recurs, mythic motifs, images, plots recur. Because myth is somehow built into the psyche. It's the way we understand life. And so rather than simply being a form of magical thinking, myth is absolutely necessary in many ways to how we get through life. And that's why it keeps recurring. 
And I don't mean just days of the week or anything like that, but think about how closely artificial intelligence repeats the old stories of the golem or some other zombie or automaton that is created to do work for human beings and then assumes a mind of its own. I think anyone who's had computer trouble can relate to that. Or think about the religious imagery of the financial market internationally, right? The invisible hand, castles in the sky. It's all mythic language. In politics, sometimes candidates say, let's get us back to the old times. Let's go back to the golden age. Let's let's be great again and all that. That's mythic language too. It's the archetype of the golden age that shows up in so much folklore. So myth is all around us and the more conscious we can be of it, the less it'll have a baleful influence on us. We can work creatively with it and that's what we do in the territory of personal myth. Now I mentioned that this idea comes from Jung, although he's speaking to something that exists in many different cultures. And there was a letter Jung wrote in 1942 to Paul Schmidt, and he was responding to something Schmidt had sent him. We don't have a copy of that, but in Jung's response, he says, you have hit the mark absolutely. All of a sudden, and with terror, it became clear to me that I have taken over Faust as my heritage. And moreover, as the advocate and avenger of Philemon and Baucis, who, unlike Faust the Superman, are the hosts of the gods in a ruthless and godforsaken age. So he's talking about a figure from German folklore, an alchemist and wizard named Faust. He's the original um, model for selling your soul to the devil. And the motif of the wizard who goes too far comes up in many different cultures all over the world. So it's an, it's an archetypal pattern. In Jung's case, he felt like he was born into the story of Faust. There was even a rumor in Jung's family that there was some illegitimate son of Goethe at some point. Goethe wrote about Faust extensively, wrote two plays. Um, Goethe also experimented with alchemy when he was younger. And so uh, Faust, the wizard and alchemist who becomes inflated by power and learns some essential lessons, the seeker who won't be satisfied, that's who Faust is. Two of his victims are Philemon and Baucis, an, an old couple who gets swept away in the reforms that Faust is putting into play. In the letter, Young continues and says, To the extent that I harbor a personal myth of this kind, you are right in nosing up a Gertian world in me. So he uses the term personal myth. Uh, elsewhere, he also refers to it as a life myth. You could think of a personal myth as a side of us that's actually invisible in a reductive, materialist world, but that can connect us to ourselves, other people, our vocation, even the world itself and what it demands at a particular historical time. Our personal myth and knowledge of it give us cultural roots in a time of supposed mythlessness. And the fact that we come in with such a, a myth is the collective psyche's way of personalizing our response to whatever situations are afoot at the time that we're born. A personal myth gives us preset tools for dealing with life and for individuating, for becoming ourselves. And in short, although a lot of us have stories in, inside of us running around in us, the personal myth is the story we are inside of. So let's have a few examples to fill this out a little bit. Uh, Young we talked about already. And notice about Young's life that Although the story of Faust is a tragedy, Jung actually turns it into something greater than the original telling. So the personal myth 
although we come in with it, it's not deterministic. It's, it's like a palette from which we paint or cloth that's given to us from which we weave. It's up to us to make use of it. And if we don't, if we remain unconscious of this deeper story, then it tends to own us. Then, then it does tend to become deterministic. So I'm thinking of, for instance, Freud, who in a letter to Wilhelm Fleiss said that he had just realized that he is Oedipus. Freud didn't have the idea of a personal myth, but he was aware that he resonated with the story of King Oedipus, the blind king, who is himself the cause of the plague of Thebes, just as Freud's dream indicated that some of his therapy with women was harming them. And in fact, Fleiss, who was kind of a quack doctor of the time, Freud referred a patient to Fleiss and he damn near killed her. <laughs> when the Nazis came for Freud, he left Vienna and lived for the rest of his life in London. He was preceded there by Anna Freud, his daughter. Just as King Oedipus, when he was exiled, was preceded into exile by his daughter, whose name was Antigone. So it makes sense that Freud referred to his daughter as my Antigone. He half sensed a lot of this. As my students know, one of my favorite examples of this, because it's so clear, is John Steinbeck, who was born, born into the story of Lancelot. The house he grew up in was called The Castle by Neighborhood Boys. His, his first novel was Cup of Gold. So, in other words, the grail, right? Um, Steinbeck was a big guy. He was a war reporter. One of the destroyers that took him into war to do journalistic work and to observe on site was called Knight, with a K. Steinbeck said his favorite virtue was gallantry. He was married at one point to a woman named Gwen. It was a disastrous marriage. They had a secret affair first. So there's Lancelot and Guinevere. He did better with his third wife, uh, Fair Elaine. So if you know the Lancelot story, you know that Elaine was the woman who loved Lancelot. And notice how, too, in this case, the story comes out a bit differently. They actually get to be together and were happily married. As an exercise, we could speculate about other public figures, too. We could talk about President Obama being Apollo, for instance, a lover of harmony, a believer in health care. We could talk about um, Marilyn Monroe as Venus, George Washington as Saturn, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as our King Arthur, even died in Memphis, a city named after the Egyptian city of kings. When we think about the bellicose politician Vladimir Putin, we might think also about Vlad the Impaler, who is the character Dracula was based on, um, a fictional character in this case, but the image of the vampire also recedes back into mythology as well. The thing about vampires is they'll suck all the vitality out of you, but they don't operate well in the day, out in the open. They do better at secret work. Carl Jung wrote an essay called Wotan, W-O-T-A-N, and in it he compared Hitler to the mythic figure of the German god Wotan. That's the name of uh, Odin. Um, Odin being a kind of wizard as well as associated with battle. But I think Young got the story right, but the character wrong. Uh, for one thing, the battle side of Odin or Wotan is um, generally overestimated. He's much more a wizard or a mage figure. And secondly, there's actually a mythic figure who I believe stands closer to Adolf Hitler. In fact, the figure's implied in his first name, Adolf, which means wolf. Hitler was actually nuts about wolves. You know, wolf lair, wolf pack, he, he was obsessed with wolves. And in terms of the story, Ragnarok, um, the, the end of the world in Norse mythology, 
involves a giant wolf named Fenris who causes untold damage on the earth. So I would guess that that's closer to what Hitler's myth was. Now, Hitler could have played a more conscious and careful part with that myth. It didn't need to show up so murderously and destructively. In the end, it's consciousness that makes the biggest difference in terms of how the myth shows up. If it's beneficial, if it's a story that we can creatively work with, or if the myth simply rides us. And then when it does, we become less than human and it has destructive consequences. Particularly when the myth aligns with something that's happening in collective life and cultural life, then it becomes even more powerful. So if you like this way of thinking, then I have a couple of suggestions for looking into your myth. One is that I wrote a book on this. There's a small book called Storied Lives, Discovering and Deepening Your Personal Myth. So that would be a source. However, it doesn't have a lot of myths in it. It just mentions them tangentially. So I actually pulled together myths from all over the world in another book, which is Myths Among Us, but you can find good mythic material all over the place. What I recommend doing, because there's so much of it, is to maybe um, look into the myths that seem to call out to you, the collections, the books, online articles, what have you, and that seem to line up with themes that keep recurring in your life. Because the more stories you know, the easier it is to determine the mythic structure of your life. If you don't know many myths, you're going to have a hard time doing it. You might look at the myths in your ethnic background, um, in the places where you grew up, and just begin to get an acquaintance with them. Now, as you do this, I recommend looking into the etymology of your names. Because there's often a clue about your personal myth buried in your name. Sometimes it's very straightforward. Um, Sometimes people have names like Venus or Diana or uh, Isis or what have you. And so then you just, you can entertain the possibility that either that's your myth or you're in that story somehow. It could be either one. But often it takes some digging. There's a website that you could begin with called BehindTheName.com. And it's pretty good in terms of getting at some of the story behind the name. That's what you want. Most baby name dictionaries just give you a very literal meaning without explaining where the story or the name come from. And so you you want something that really digs into where did this name originate, what did it mean, that kind of thing, right? Now, um, a note about if you have more than one name, like a lot of people... Not everybody um, in European culture and American culture, we often have a first name and a middle name after the Roman pattern. If that's true for you, then look at the name you dislike the most. (laughs) Because often it's not only your mythic name, but there's a lesson in there for you. There's something there to integrate into your life. My middle name is Stephen, which I didn't used to like much. And then I dug into the etymology, and I liked it a lot more, and so that helped. Um, Sometimes we don't like our first name when we go by our middle name, so investigate where your first name comes from. And uh, if possible, the fantasies of the people who gave you that name and what they were thinking about. It doesn't always reveal something, but it often does. And then in terms of a last name, uh, oftentimes that's the, it's kind of the field of action for your myth thematically speaking, metaphorically speaking. So as an example, um, my last name, Chalkvist, is actually an Americanized version of the Swedish name Kalkvist. And my name is a, my last name is a combination of two words, Kal, which means, uh, it's similar to Charles, <clears throat> means a common man. And uh, a kvist is a, a twig or a small branch. And What you often find is that people who do a lot of work with nature, which I do as an eco-psychologist, as well as a gardener and other in other capacities as well, but people who have a strong nature connection often have some nature in their name. It's interesting. And again, not always, but often. Another place I would look is at the stories that obsessed you when you were a kid. 
the ones you had to have read to you over and over, the movies that you watched over and over, those kinds of stories. Uh, oftentimes, the story will not be a myth, but it will refer to a myth. So, um, years ago, one of my students mentioned that she was obsessed with Beauty and the Beast, and it turned out on her further investigation that there was a lot of resonance with her and the Psyche and Cupid story. So, especially in terms of Psyche. And the more she learned about Psyche, the more she could see symbolic parallels between her life and Psyche's, even down to having three sisters she did not always get along with. This can get very specific. John Steinbeck accidentally lit himself on fire once in a way that evoked Lancelot being hit by lightning in the Grail Castle. So, I mean, these, this is very specific stuff when it plays out like that. You'll want to, in general, turn a thematic eye on your life and look for recurring patterns, especially kinds of relationships, choice of work, uh, religious observance, um, recurring mishaps, core values and goals, um, favorite causes, favorite virtues, inner conflicts, and uh, look to what you would be doing if you're not already, uh, if you didn't have to worry about things like income. Because there's a lot of us that have jobs and careers that we don't enjoy, and that, that's not necessarily an indicator of one's myth. It usually does occupy a place in the story somewhere, but what does your mythic self want? What do you really desire from life? That'll give you a better clue. As an exercise also, um, ask yourself, what do I most value? above everything else and really sit with that because each of these mythic figures values something different with Apollo it's order and reason with Isis it would be nurturing and care with Osiris it's death and, and rebirth it's different for every mythic presence the phoenix wants to be burned up and so it can be reborn additionally you can also ask for a dream about your myth just some night when you're falling asleep, turn to your own unconscious and say, what's my myth? And some people have successfully had dreams that cue them in. So that's something to try. You can ask your friends, if I were a fictional character, what kind of character would that be? That can be useful, especially if you collect a lot of responses and there tend to be overlapping patterns. And speaking of dreams, What's the first dream you remember having in childhood? Often it's heavily mythical. Uh, even if the mythic elements or creatures don't stand out as mythic, but the, if you look at the dream in comparison to the old stories, it often has a mythic element. Um, I had early recurring dreams of being chased by um, winged beasts who were spewing fire. And at first I thought they were dragons, but... I investigated a little more thoroughly, and now I think they were phoenixes. They didn't look like a traditional classic phoenix in the dream, but they acted like it. Thematically, it's a good fit. So that tells me a little bit about what my deeper story might be. My experience has been that to the degree that you can understand and wake up to your myth, it gives you a preset bunch of strengths and also warnings, things to avoid. And in this way, one can live eudaimonically, which means in accord with your innermost spirit. Some would even say your soul. And in accord with the larger story behind the story you're familiar with. Thank you.